I'm good. Right, so all good. welcome on the show, Martin. Thanks very much. Right, thank Pleasure you for, to be here. Thank, thank you for having coming me. along. So it's good, as I was saying before, we don't really know each other. No. So you're about to blow my mind. Which is amazing, really. Find out all about yourself. Aye. Exactly, I So on social media, I had a wee look just before you came out, and uh, there must be, I think we've got about 16 or 17 mutual friends. Aye. We'll play all the same sort of places. Didn't live that far away from each no. other than that, but it's just one of those ones where a path I've never crossed. It's difficult when you're gigging though as well, like Aye. when, just like what we were saying earlier, when you've got... You didn't get a chance to go and see other people, see when, because you're no, all you gigging don't. on the same night, Aye. and uh, you play all the same places, mm-hmm. but I'll be in on the Friday night, then you're in on the Saturday Aye. night, and you're not there on the Friday night because you're somewhere else. Because I'm somewhere else, eh? Aye, or you're working, or life talk gets in the way. recently about that, if... Uh, it was the Stirling Song Club yesterday I was there that uh, Barry Honeyman runs with yep. uh, Baza Mills and uh, so they were doing they do that and I was saying to somebody after that that that's pretty that's a great place I think other than getting to hear people playing and getting to hear all this different stuff which is pretty cool yep. you get to meet folk and get a chat with folk that mm-hmm. you never normally get to see for that exact reason you're always you playing know, eh? but it's funny you say that cause see about two or three weeks ago um, Scott Ashworth puts on a lot of open mic nights. Uh-huh. Now, I've never went along to one uh-huh. because I'm always very much of the this is for people that have never done a gig that maybe just fancy get up to do a few songs just uh-huh. to, to try it out. Mm-hmm. And because I've been gigging for like 15 years, uh-huh. I'm like, nah, it's, it's, I haven't got time mm-hmm. for that. But I went along to one that he done two or three weeks ago, and you know what? It was, a, it was just yeah. exactly what you said there. I yeah. actually got a chance to sit and talk to Scott Aye. and talk to this person that person meet a couple of people it's that the only time I've similar seen. to yourself <laughs> that where it's like I know who you are uh-huh. I hear about you all the time but I've never got the chance to sort of speak and um, that was another person that, who was it was it Jerry from the Smoking Guns oh aye, so aye. He, he was there and again he was the same as yourself mm-hmm. we actually work in the same office so, yeah. so I've seen him <laughs> play all these gigs hear about him that was the first time I've ever actually got to sit down and actually chat to the guy. I knew he's coming on to the podcast Good. Uh, next month. Jerry's, Jerry's like the sexiest man in music around here. I was disappointed because he got shot of his moustache. He, he? he had a oh. summer moustache on for a while. Nah. <laughs> nah, I'm not having that. <laughs> but, I'm going uh, to phone him later, give him a row. Uh, that was a glorious moustache. He can always grow it back though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I was just jealous. I was like, look at that here. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know too much about you, so mm-hmm. where... Where are you from? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Malawa. Right. Aye. Originally, was born through Glasgow direction, Bells Hill, and then stayed through there till I was bah, young enough to be pretty much for Alawa, put it that way. Right. And then, uh, aye, that's been me. So, so see, when you were a wee kid, mm-hmm. growing up, were you into music from a very young age, or was it simply background noise? And no, I was into music for... As far, as, back, far as, back as I can remember, yeah, I think. And were you like most people, did you, if you were into music then, did you get into it through an older brother, sister, a parent? But who was it uh, in your family that was into the music? Parents, really, yeah. That's, they were both just massive music fans, eh? They're, my dad played a bit different things when he was younger. And, as uh, an instrument was? I, I played a bit of bass, played some uh, kind of like but stuff they, you would do maybe at the school, things like that. But the two of them just loved their music? Just loved what, it, what sort yeah. of stuff were they listening loved to? It. What were My they dad was into, to? Well, I was telling this story the other day to somebody as well, going through my mum and dad's, uh, I've, I've got the box up the stairs, they're all record boxes, amazing. <laughs> yep. Because my dad was right into punk, stuff like that when he was younger. So you're flicking through this box and you've got like, UK subs, uh, that'll be our, our original fingers, uh, old EPs ones, yeah. as well. That yeah, if you were to go and buy them now, I will bet you can't even get some of the original artwork in there. Probably, you'll get it in Europa. That's the only place in the world probably. you'll get it. Right. Probably, but flicking through it, and you get UK subs, the Ruts, and uh, you know stuff like that, the Clash, Sex Pistols, right. and then the next one's like Thriller, and then we're back to like Crass and things like that, and right. then you end up at. Lionel Richie makes an appearance. <laughs> so that's brilliant. I used to love sitting going through the box and just picking stuff and, and just Probably putting Probably like Guinness Mega Mix yeah. in there somewhere. Oh, <laughs> there's bound to be. I, I've not got to that one yet. It's quite a big collection. So were you just flicking through that when you were wee? 
Aye. Or just hearing them playing it, or maybe you're jumping the car with your dad. But both their music was everywhere when I was oh. younger. Eh? It was everywhere in the house. Every it was music for every occasion. Eh? There was so always what, music in the car, always music in the house. And so you 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 liked your music growing up then, and you're mm-hmm. obviously getting influenced whether you, you knew it or not mm-hmm. by your your parents. But uh, what age were you when you like, was there a light bulb moment when you all like, sort so, so discovered your own style like that? What is this? I like this. Uh, this is something new that, that's nothing related to your parents. This is like you've discovered your own little thing that you love. What was it? I and, and it what age were you going? I would have been ten. Yep. I would have been ten, and it was when uh, I saw the video for Sweet Child of Mine on the telly. Right. Okay. And I saw Slash doing the, uh, the guitar like solo. the start. Obviously, him starting the solo and the big solo and everything like that. And then at the end, as soon as I saw that video, I'm and like, it's so iconic. That's it. Aye. I want to be him. I don't want to be like him, I want to be that man. Who's your top hat? I know. I, you just you kind of pulled that, that off, away. <laughs> thought that was maybe a step too far. Or wearing your sunglasses Aye. inside? Aye. Aye, you'd like to be a real rock star. Aye, you kind of have to, to be that. a rock star to do. So, like taking your top off on stage, you kind of do that to your So, were Guns N' Roses your go to back? Was that the one mm. that started it all for you? Aye. Because you, I, I look, I obviously looked up your um, Facebook page. Uh huh. Since of yourself, I know you're, you're 10 years younger than me. Right. Obviously, Guns N' Roses would have been out for a long time before oh, you I, I, discovered them. Mm-hmm. But was that on like a music channel or something like uh, that? It was on Kerrang. Right. It was on the music TV, so. And was that what that. made you got a guitar before then, or was that what made you want to pick up a guitar? That was pretty much what made me want to play the guitar, I think. Right. So, so, I did, saw that. Did on you the ask trailer. for a guitar, uh, get it for your Christmas, your birthday, something like got that? Got it for my Christmas, aye. And then I had my first lesson. A guy, Martin Phillip. And, well, I was and, going to ask you, uh, did did you get lessons or were you self-taught or was it a bit of both? Or I did initially. I got mm-hmm. lessons for about a couple of years when I first got the guitar. Yep. My dad had went and uh, asked a mutual pal, Tony, uh, Tony Duffy, for some advice and he says uh, he offered Martin up as a teacher. So right. I went along to him. I probably went to him for a couple of years, I think. It's similar to myself because he stopped, he gave it up, mm. and then I just never ever really got a teacher mm. after that. I just kind of he, similar, he uh, gave me the basics, and then I just ran with it after that. It's similar to myself because I was ten as well. Mm-hmm. What is a guitar? And it, it's a big purchase. Totally. So you know the the parents were like, okay, we'll, we'll get you. It. Mm-hmm. However, you need to go to lessons, nah. even if it's just to learn the basics. And I probably went for maybe a couple of years. Mm-hmm. It was my thing because it was very much a. I don't know what the book was we were using, but nah. it was like, you know, step one of uh-huh. learning the guitar. You're like and Mel Bay's guitar book and, and, and what I went to, it was, it was um, Woodlands High School right. in Falkirk, it's not there anymore. Uh-huh. But uh, the guy obviously rented out a classroom. Right. The guy was a good guitar player, uh-huh. and it was so you'd, you'd do four or five people in the same lesson. Right, okay. You'd go along, so you'd be like, you sitting, and then next to you'd be like a guy who was like in his 30s, but when you're like, uh, Ten year old, you're like this guy's ancient, and then, <laughs> and then it'd be like he's a, older than the hills. Uh, and then it'd be like a woman, and then it'd be like a wee lassie and stuff, and uh-huh. and uh, every, we'd all start, and then every week it'd be like you'd see everybody progressing. Uh-huh. I wasn't progressing because I was like this is boring, uh-huh. but I kind of stuck it out uh-huh. just to learn the basic chords and that. But probably similar to yourself, when I was going home, mm-hmm. I was like trying to learn stuff myself of yeah. stuff that was far too advanced, but. Still trying to learn it. I try it. And, uh, and then you're hunting the music shops. Obviously, I was brought up before YouTube and that, so mm-hmm. you're hunting music shops, trying to find sheet the music, books, uh, hoping that there's tab. <laughs> I hope there's tab the bottom that, right? because I, I couldn't really read yeah. the actual the notes, or uh-huh. I could kind of read it, but I was like, I don't know how that relates to the fretboard. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I hoping there was some sort of tab, that, and you'd figure out little guitar riffs and little bits and pieces, and uh-huh. it was quite cool. So. I've cast your mind back. Do you remember the first album you ever bought with your own money? Hybrid Theory. Lincoln Park. Yeah. Their first album. You know what? Nine ninety nine. Out of Willie's and Aloe. I had someone on... That's how clearly I remember that. I had a, a guy called Aaron Hobkirk. Right. From a band called The Colony on. Right. I think... It was either him or it was a band from Glasgow called Low Level Monk. Right. I'd asked them what was your first album and I think that it was the same oh, one this was the one just the other day Aye. 
Yeah, it's so a crack album, brilliant album. And then it Loved was, it. It, they kept saying that, that, and it was um, Limp Biscuit. Oh, aye. Right. Right. So it was obviously like late 90s aye. new metal. It was that new metal kind of phase. Kind of stuff. Eh? Were you into that? Aye. Aye. I loved it, eh? I went through... Because I, I, I was already... I was already like 16, mm-hmm. 15, 16 by the time that came around. And then it never caught me because I always preferred the rock stuff before it where there was a, a proper rhythm and a proper lead. Mm-hmm. And that Aye. kind of obviously kind of got put aside and detuned. Aye. But I mean, the, it still the new metal stuff still had its its own place and there uh-huh. was still stuff that was brilliant that just rocked. Aye. But I, I liked the rhythm and lead type Aye. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, like Guns and Noses, mm-hmm. Slash and Izzy. Totally, aye. That's that's it's funny that, eh? Because it does, and it has came back round again. Aye, I I, I, want, I I was going to say your taste change, but I don't know if they do. You just learn to appreciate and like mm. more stuff. If you think about it now, there'll be stuff that your mum and dad mm. listen to that you'll still like nowadays. Mm-hmm. There'll be stuff that you didn't think you liked that you'll hear it now and you'll go. Actually, that's, that, that's pretty decent. There's the stuff that you fell in love with when you're a, becoming a teenager and all that. Uh-huh. Your guns and roses and that. I think till your dying day, you will still sit and listen to them and, and like it. Aye, totally. But uh, I kind of got to this point where I kind of felt like it's funny. I spoke to quite a few people about this. I'll get your thoughts on it, right? So, fifties you had rock and roll, mm-hmm. right? Music was changing because yep. it was pretty much shit before then, uh-huh. right? So you've got rock, <laughs> rock and roll in the 50s, right? 60s, you've got all your crazy drug stuff and uh-huh. it was just was brilliant. Uh-huh. 70s had, obviously, continuation of that. You had, obviously, all your disco stuff. You had your punk stuff coming out towards the end. Mm-hmm. 80s definitely had its own uh, 80s its sound, right? You had your hair metal and all that. You then had, obviously, in the 90s, you were still getting new stuff coming out that sounded different from anything that had happened before that mm-hmm. but I always feel when it got to 2000 mm-hmm. still plenty of good music that's happened in the last 20 years mm-hmm. but I don't feel like anything new has come out that actually it's, this is a new sound that's never been done before mm. it's just I always feel like it's a rehash and I don't know if it's because see when 2000 came around uh-huh. I'm 18 I've already discovered all the uh-huh. stuff that I wanted to discover and uh, there's still stuff I'll discovered since then that I love Aye. but it's not a different sound that's never been heard before it's just Aye. a rehash of something that's already been done is that how you take it or been I don't know I I don't know I think like in your good I mean there's only 12 notes eh? so mm-hmm. there's there's only so far you can you can take you can take that way and it we're thinking guitar based, you know, there's only so far you can take a guitar based sound yeah. in that direction. But my cousin was, uh, he was into his dance stuff, he, he mm-hmm. loves dance music and that. So I got exposed to a lot of that through him. And it's not really my bag, but I used to go to nights and, you know, I'd hear the tunes through him and it was, it was different for me, eh? but yeah. he kept telling me about, oh, there's this new stuff and then there's, he got all this new stuff and then dubstep came out. I was like, what is what is this? Yeah. And nobody's ever heard this before. So, I think it is still evolving. You know, that the music is still evolving. It's just not so much in the guitar-based sphere anymore. It's maybe you know, a just lot of it's different, digital. different styles. But ah. then the recording technique changed. Mm-hmm. And I think that maybe changed the way people write songs. Not, ah. not for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Because when you get guys like, you know, like Skrillex was a big name, obviously. He, the sort of impact he had on it, but he combined a lot of stuff, you know what I mean, the, just... Or maybe I'm not looking in the right places, I think maybe, well, there is, maybe there's still good stuff, unique stuff coming yeah. out, but it's just, it's, not it's maybe not, it's not in the forefront. Uh, you know, if, if you're relying on the radio or something, then you're looking in the wrong places. I was watching a documentary the other week about, uh, about uh, Scotland, and they were going around all the young teams and everything like that, and like, kind of, a Ross Kemp type, I think. Oh, yeah. eh? It wasn't a Ross Kemp, but it was like him. Anyway, they're going round and then all the guys are talking about this drill music. I'm going, what's drill? I've never heard of that. Right, okay. It's like a, a, it's, it's a thing. This is new to me. Uh, all right, it's okay. new to me. It was new to me at the time as well, so it's not my bag. But 
to answer your question, I think there is still stuff and there's still progression and stuff in music, but it's just maybe no something to my taste that I, that I follow. And then well, you just happen upon something like this and go, oh, somebody it's is funny doing something. It's funny because I had Shawnee Sherman on. Aye. Right? And he was telling me, you know, massive pop fan, mm-hmm. 80s uh-huh. pop stuff, but he says, pop music in the 80s is not what pop music is no. nowadays, he says that no. has changed, totally, aye. he says back then it was maybe bands as well, mm-hmm. playing top of pops, all that sort of aye. stuff, whereas now he says it might just be an artist with, you know, it doesn't sound like it, it just sounds electronic, you yeah. know, it's, it's just different or that, but, so it's Guns N' Roses that got you, that was a big one for me, Got you into what other bands were you discovering back then? Back then, Lincoln Park, obviously. Lincoln Park was a yeah. thing. Papa Roach were a big band. They ever stained was the first band I ever seen live. Where did you see them? That was the SECC. Yep, as it was then. And Papa Roach. They still on the go. Stained. I don't know. I was talking to somebody about that recently. It was on the west coast of aye. like America, yeah, like California kind aye. of. Aye, they did the. They had an album called. I think it was Break the Cycle was the album I went to. I was talking to somebody uh, a few months back and I was saying, ah, I saw that I saw them on their first album tour and they were going, That's not their first album. That was like yeah. their third or something like that. But there was that Papa Roach tour, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I liked about I wasn't a big stained fan. To me they sound a bit like Pearl Jam who again I'd like I'd liked eight years before Aye. or something like that. But what they did which I liked was I seen them do one, uh, I don't know if it was a one-off gig, but obviously they're a rock band, mm-hmm. but they put the rock guitars away, they took out the acoustics, uh-huh. and they could still, the songs converted uh-huh. easily from the rock stuff right over perfectly to the acoustic, mm-hmm. and I was like, that, sometimes I kind of think that's maybe, a, you know that's a good song, see if it can jump between Absolutely. you two. It's like a some, hallmark of a good song, I mean, isn't it? Some songs don't need it, but I still think it's something pretty cool. Aye. If it does that, I've heard it said before. Eh, how if you can play a song on a campfire on its then it'll carry anywhere. Eh? It doesn't matter what production you put around it. Do you remember what the first guitar was that you got? Still got it. Still got it. Aye, still got it. It was a Westfield uh, Strat, a blue Westfield Strat copy. Do you still use it or is it in storage now? Nah, it's, it's still in the room. It's, it's, it's in the guitar rack, but I never really play it that much anymore. See, I've got an Aria Pro. Which was like uh-huh. a, it looked like a, f- a Stratocaster uh-huh. copy, like the black with the white scratch The one that plate. had the humbucker in it. Yeah, yeah. Aye, aye. And uh, it's sat in, in a hard case up the loft for 30 mm-hmm. years, and I got it out last year, and I took it to a shop and got the electrics all replaced uh-huh. and that, and I'm back using it again. Uh-huh. And you know what? It sounds just as good as the uh-huh. day I got it. Ah, uh-huh. good. Okay. But it's that thing, everything that's white and it's now faded to that weird uh, yellow like colour. Yellow, aye. <laughs> Creamy, creamy yellow. Uh, right, but... Uh, I went for that and then I ended up, because of the music I was into, I liked a lot of Sum 41 and that kind of stuff as well when, when they came yep. out. And, and I was looking for that kind of heavier sound. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know how I can't get this. And it turns out it's because you're trying to play it on a strat, eh? It's this. Looking back on it now, I'm yeah. going, I'm trying to play it on a strat. Just no wonder it did they sound right, but I got a Les Paul just shortly after that. The Epiphone Les Paul. And uh, that was the sound. So was it just was uh, it. the American Pie soundtrack sound? Pretty much. Yeah, right, after Sum 41, Offspring. Offspring, loved them. Oh, those kind of I saw them a couple of years ago, they sound exactly the same as they did back then. Aye. They're incredible. And boys. you just need to get a decent arm, and always remember so, I got a Marshall. Aye. And it was a, a valve state, you didn't even get them anymore. <laughs> right? Hundred watt. And I was looking I was a big Metallica guy, so I was looking for like the black album sound. Aye, right. Aye. And I can remember my pal Zero came, mid-range. My pal came like. down and he's like, This is how you do it. Right, there's two overdrives. Never mind the first one, Se- second one's a powerful <laughs> one. Get aye. that switched on. And it was a uh, it was a uh, the, the setting was bass. Right round uh-huh. to 10 or 11, right? Uh-huh. Right round to as to far as you can go. Middle, right round to zero. Uh-huh. Treble, about maybe six. Uh-huh. And that was your, your Metallica was sound. You. And uh-huh. I think that's actually still the sound that they use to this day. Probably, yeah. It just works for mm-hmm. them. Yeah. But it uh, blows your speakers out. Like, see, uh-huh. trying to like mix something like that. You need somebody like Bob Rock in a million pound studio to actually totally, yeah. record something like that. Because it's just... I still well, was again speaking about this the other day when I had uh, Enter Sandman came on on the telly 
and it was the you get the whole intro eh, and yeah, you get the, the, the hi hats and all that, and then see as soon as the drums come in, I don't know what they did to the drums, but that is that's no fair, eh? Uh, what they well, did because nobody else can record drums after that. That's just incredible. What's amazing is that that's more than thirty year old, right? But see when you put it on now, it still sounds better than most albums, that, band mm. albums that come out. Like, but they they spent. I think they spent about three months just trying to get a drum sound. Nah. Like, but it's all the that was all the producer. Uh-huh. Producer came in last album. He was like, songs, everything's everything's great. Your sound is shit. Nah. And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Nah. And he's like, no, no. I, he's like, I want because I think they wanted him to mix. And he went, no, no. I want to produce it. Aye. Aye. And he took the producer's them aside. got a huge role, eh? Right? But he took them aside and he's like, right, we need to get these drums sounding as big as possible. So I think they they recorded in a big live room. Right. And uh, but it, that back then it was uh, one sound. Back then though, it was still real to real. Right. Uh-huh. So it was like do a whole drum track, and then it's like right, we're going to record eight different fills for that. But we'll pick the best one, cut and splice, cut and splice. Uh-huh. Nowadays you would just pro tool it, and uh-huh. just obviously it'd be Control a lot easier. Set. But I think they all, I think they all fell out each other by the end of it because oh, it was such a would. nightmare to record. But looking back, they're they're all like, I'm so glad that uh-huh. we actually done that. Uh-huh. But oh, absolutely! Like, it's the producer's got such a huge, huge say in, in the way some. I say a huge say. You know, they're very got, much the got a big effect on how something the, comes out. The fifth member of the band, absolutely. or something, whatever, how many, you know, whatever it is. But on the, the previous episode, we were talking about the Black Album, mm-hmm. and I'm saying it still sells to this day. It's one of the best selling albums of all time. See if they didn't have that producer, they would have right. had the same songs, same order. Same, mm. but it, it, would not, like it would not have sounded no. anywhere near as good. The reason that's done so well is partly because of how it sounds. Uh-huh. And they've never actually, I don't think they've done better than that since, sound wise. Like, it's still no, I would, just I would, as good. I would agree. The new one's good, but it's not the Black Album. The problem no, I've got not. with the new one is it's good. It sounds too good that yeah. you know that it has just been edited beyond Wait, belief. Yeah. Whereas the Black Album still sounds like a band jamming in a room. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how they record now, but I'm guessing what they do is they record as a lot of copy and paste. Right, we got that verse, yeah. let's copy and paste it. I don't think they do it from start to finish mm-hmm. anymore. And I think that kind of takes away. You can overlay a lot of stuff, you know. It's like almost too perfect. Aye. You think of all these bands from the 60s and 70s, imagine if they had the technology that they've got now, it probably could... Would it have sounded like it did? It would have sounded better, but would the songs have sounded worse? It's an interesting thought, eh? But see what if would I, they have done? See for yourself, right, so you get, are you about 10, 11 when you get your guitar? Aye, 10 I was, aye. So doing lessons, when does it creep into your mind, I'm going to, I'd like to start my first band? I think I was about thirteen, maybe. 12, how, 13, how did you? Man. How did you go about it? How did a thirteen-year-old for for your age go about starting a band? I was when I went to high school. I went to Alva Academy. And I met. I got pally with a couple of guys. One guy played the drums. One guy played the bass. This just guys in your so, year. I just guys in the year that yeah, that you go to. A, they interest. were at different primary schools for me, so I didn't know them until I went to high school, and then you kind of. That's you remember pals. what it was like when you went to high school and you go and find your wee gang of pals getting your new right. pals and all that and you didn't talk to half the folk you've grew up with so far and aye. I like so. these guys because they all like listening to the same music aye, as me they like, we, were, we were moshers <laughs> eh, when we were we. Aye, aye, that, that's I we think that's what people deal. thought my name was because that's what got <laughs> shouted at me for like seven, six aye. years when I was at high school aye, so we got that we all kind of we all kind of banded together and that was us and yep. then I played the guitar and one of the boys played the drums, one played the, the bass, and we're like, hey, do you know what, I think we should do a band. Well, we do a band, aye, right, we'll do a band then. So we, that's Do you remember, you're, you're going to tell me your amazing band name. What was the band called? Well, that's terrible. Can't even remember. Like the amount of bands I've known that have split up before they even reached their first gig because <laughs> they couldn't agree on a band name and it's like uh-huh. you've got five guys coming in with like 30 suggestions and uh-huh. nobody likes any suggestion uh-huh. to the point that it's like oh, we'll just call ourselves I don't know 
the carpets because aye. you've got to call yourself the, something. Aye, you've got to call yourself something, but aye. we split up because we didn't want to play Summer of 69. <laughs> <laughs> we had a big fight over Summer of 69 and that was it, that was the end of the band, never going to play again. Right. And then we got back together a week later and started playing other stuff. Still never played Summer of 69. See when you start your band, mm-hmm. right, you're playing the guitar, are you just playing the guitar at that point or are you being like, but you've got the vocals, we need a singer? Aye, there was a bit of... It was mainly just playing the guitar. Because you're not going to have... The drummer's no generally going to sing. No. Right? Bass players like to kind of hide away at the side mm. and blink in with the drummer if they can. Mm. So it's usually the guitarist that's like, oh, well, somebody's got to do it. Uh-huh. So if there's nobody willing to do it, I suppose I'm going to have to do it. Was that kind uh, of the situation you found yourself in? More or less. That was... And I still didn't... I always actively tried not to sing. Mm-hmm. Because I hated it. I still... Dis- well, I say hate it, I still dislike it. Yeah. yeah. I think you're similar to myself, right? That I started out, I was a guitarist, mm-hmm. right? I wanted to be James Hetfield and Kirk Hammett combined. I wanted uh, to do rhythm and lead. No interest in singing, yeah. right? Started a band when I was a teenager, right mm-hmm. through the 90s, and it was like, we had a guy who was just singing. There was five of us, mm-hmm. so I'm like doing the guitars, there's another guitarist, he's just singing, right, uh, I'll do a bit of backing singing, right, uh, that, that's easy, uh, because, that, that's because that. you're not really doing much, right, uh, and uh, never gave it much thought at all mm-hmm. throughout teenage years, joined the band when I was in my 20s, mm-hmm. didn't even really do any backing singing, I was like, I'm just want to play the guitar, I'm happy just playing the guitar, uh, and then I started to write my own songs, mm-hmm. and I was like, with the idea I was going to get a band, ah. I was going to put a band together, never happened just because life gets in the way. So you try to find three or four individuals that use it on the same page and all that. But I was like, I've got all these songs, I was like, I'm, I'm going to start recording them just to record them. Ah. And I was like, right, well, I suppose it, it, loads of them were instrumentals, and I was like, ah. maybe try doing a bit of singing. It's See that thing? Lofty. So <laughs> it's that thing where playing the guitar, give me ah. something to play it, I'll confidently play it uh-huh. right see trying to sing I'm like it wasn't until later on so much of singing is confidence now of course you need to be capable of singing you need uh-huh. to be able to hear yourself and go I'm in tune no no I'm not in tune uh-huh. being able to sing is a weird one and, and I, I started doing the pub gigs uh-huh. and I've done them for years and years and years with Liam yep back and singing doing lead guitar uh-huh. so only two years ago I finally I'm in my 40s, uh-huh. switched over and went, right, I'm going to do a rhythm guitar. So when lockdown happened uh-huh. and everything shut down completely, uh-huh. and I was like, what did I do now? I was like, right, I'm going to learn the rhythm parts mm-hmm. and, uh, and then I'm going to go and do, see if I can do some singing because I've been recording myself singing for about 10 years, uh-huh. but not really in front of anyone. Uh-huh. Kind of got uh-huh. into that way. And I'm still that thing, because I'm so confident on the guitar, uh-huh. I'm not like that with my vocals, uh-huh. and even now, nowadays I'm a bit like, obviously I know I can sing because I've been doing all these gigs, folk wouldn't book you again if you couldn't, if, if you, you could sing the tune, but I'm still, I wouldn't say I'm 100% confident, uh-huh. but I'm kind of getting there, but how did you, did you just, similar to myself, just start singing and get better at it? I, I mean, you didn't, so. you, you didn't go to lessons. No. No. And you just, did you just do it long enough that you eventually found, right, this is my, my style? Like, because it took me a while, like, what I used to do with all my instrumental stuff, mm-hmm. I'd write it all, never with the vocals in mind, and then uh-huh. at the end I'd be like, I better start singing something on it to see what it sounds like. I mean, that's that, kind of... And the key's, too, the key's wrong, it's too high, it's uh-huh. too low, and then it's only in the last couple of years, right, I know what I'm capable uh-huh. of singing, and then I write my songs with that in mind. I'm about that, I totally, that's kind of... That's probably the way, I mean, like I said, I always actively tried not to be the singer, mm-hmm. just because I hated singing, I didn't like singing. Was that lack of so, confidence, do you think? I don't know. I'd be looking, or you, looking back on it, probably. Yeah. Probably was, I was always a bit nervous about that, singing. That I and like also it. the fact that you just liked playing the guitar. I had my comfort blanket that was my guitar uh, that I liked. and you know, I Drummers hidden behind these drums, yeah. everybody can concentrate on their guitars. I was quite happy doing that, yeah. it was great. And then... As times went on, you know, like there was always lead singers in pretty much every band that I was ever in. I, since I was like 14 maybe, 
Yeah. Did a bit of singing in that first band we were talking about, but it was only three of us, and me and the bass player used to share it. And then there's been a lead singer pretty much in every band ever since. And then I went, uh, I moved down to Liverpool when I was 18, and then I was there for a couple of years. And the band that I was in down there, they had a, again had a lead singer. I came back up the road, and that's when I started the pub stuff, you know, like mm-hmm. doing the pub kind of stuff. But I was sitting feeling all sorry for myself in the Oakwood on a Sunday. Yep. Just fed up because like I wasn't playing anymore. I was yeah. used to playing all the time, and just all of a sudden wasn't playing anymore. So Craig Stewart said to me, "Like, go and bring your guitar." So I went and got my guitar. Get up and have a shot. I basically went up. I think I only knew about five songs or something like that, like cover tunes I could play from start to finish and yep. sing it at the same time. Eh? So I did that. So was this like a Friday, Saturday night? That was a Sunday afternoon, I think. Ah, right, okay. Aye. It, right, so it was just a wee chance. Because I was going to say, do you remember your first actual, I suppose that was your first actual pub gig? The first pub gig, aye. But see, the, most pub gigs you play, it's three hours. Right? Uh-huh. It'll be 9 aye. to 12, something like that. Aye. Maybe if it's a Sunday at 4 to 7. Aye. Right? But three hours is a long, long time it's to play. It's a long time, isn't it? And I can always remember being like, right, well, Let's let's assume it's five minutes a song, nah. right? You're, you're playing like 40 plus songs, that's nah. a lot of singing. Nah. And I can remember when I first started, I was practicing in here and I did a couple of Facebook lives that uh-huh. everyone was doing during lockdown yeah. and I would get to like an hour and 10 minutes and my throat would start to go. Right. I was clearly obviously just either in the wrong key or I wasn't doing it correctly and over time I kind of like figured out okay I don't need to belt this out because that's the whole point in the microphone Aye. is that it picks up what you're, Absolutely. What you're doing but uh, because I'd played with Liam mm-hmm. for the 10 years before it there were so many songs I knew Aye. I was of the the in the weird situation that I had enough songs Aye. it was more just the right I need to work on my voice so that mm-hmm. I know that I can actually do a three hour gig but there's loads of guys I know that they're like I've got my first gig and uh, super nervous and I only had an hour and a half Aye. of songs so, and they'd all done the same thing played it twice <laughs> played play it twice and you'd obviously have different people the second half or they'd Aye. be drunk by that point and they wouldn't remember, Aye, remember so that. what about yourself when you first started what was your, your set up yeah, more or less well after that uh, that Sunday it was more or less a uh, Right, that was good. Uh, come back when you've got a couple of years and we'll, okay, we'll get you sorted. So I yep. did that and just learned songs. And I knew a lot of songs, you know, I knew a lot of songs I could play. I was, by the, at that point, I was pretty, you know, I was able to pick stuff up. I've, got, I've been blessed with a good ear so I can kind of just mm-hmm. pick stuff up through listening to it. And I picked up a lot of stuff. I listened to a lot of music, so terms of the songs and all that, I kind of had a lot of it. And I'm then, assuming you've obviously got friends and seen other people playing. Aye, totally aye, like b- between like Liam and Sue and Ken, boys like that, like when I first got into the whole pub thing, I'm going along to watch them, like 18, 19, or maybe even a bit older than that, by the time so, I came back up to Liverpool, but you're listening to the guys, you know, you're going out for a pint and you're listening to the guys mm-hmm. and you're listening to what they're playing. Just taking note. Aye, and you're kind of going, oh that went doing well. Mm-hmm. or whether it's you're listening and you went that went down well or the fact that you've caught yourself up being at Bike Works down the front going oh this is a good song yeah. or, or you, that, see, you see you them playing notes. something and it gets a good aye, reaction totally, yeah. crowd reaction right, I better learn that yeah, one oh, I bet I my thought I used to have it not so much on this one but and phones in the past I've had like wee notepad things eh? yeah, and it's yeah. been like, like if I'm out having a beer or whatever or, I still do that nah, <laughs> you hear somebody play a good song and you go oh that's a belter ah, how yeah. do I think of that I've never thought of that before nah, write like, that down it's weird though because see the amount of times that you, like over the years where I've been like this is a great tune nah. I'm going to learn this this is going to go down amazing nah. learn it and you play it and it's just like Thanks. fucking tumbleweed it's just like <laughs> totally it's a brilliant tune <laughs> and you've played it alright uh-huh. but just for whatever reason it, it's no, just no meant to be uh-huh. it's not suited for the pub mm-hmm. or for an, somebody on an acoustic guitar what's equally whatever. as interesting though is when you play something totally left field because I'm kind of at the point now where I play what I play and if if people book me to play like in a pub or whatever, it's mm-hmm. usually on recommendation for somebody else or because they've seen me before. Ah, of course. Or something like that. So they're kind of aware of Your what I do. Your name is out there now, so they know They're who aware you are. of what I do. Ah. So if you're booking me to play the pub, 
you're booking me to play what I play. Like mm-hmm. I'm no playing, I'm no learning chart songs, I'm no learning all this, that, and the other thing just because it will please your punters. Right? Yep. It's, it is what it is for that. You either like it or you kit. don't. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's plenty of other people out there that that will do exactly what you want. Mm-hmm. And well, if, I, like, if I didn't fit for your crowd, then then so be it. But the, don't, the interesting, don't again. aye, the the interesting bit is as well, and that's. Just when I'm playing that back in my head, it does sound a wee bit arrogant, but I didn't mean it that way. What I mean is, is there's there's a lot of there's a lot of work and effort that goes into it. And when somebody says, "I just learned this," how do you know Ken that yet? And you're, you're going, it, it's good. I'm not a jukebox. It's, it's good that people are, are different. Aye, no, totally. totally. So imagine we all played uh, the same thing. How boring uh, would that be? Right. So, for example, I went to see Shawnee uh-huh. n- not too long ago, and I, and I liked it because I knew. Three quarters of his set list is going to be different from what I play. Totally, right? That's what he I like lo- about Johnny. He, as he well. loves his eighties stuff, Aye. right? And he's playing songs that I'm like, it's a great tune, mm-hmm. but I just know I don't I play, it, play it, Aye. right? But then I'll go and see Liam, uh-huh. right? And I know Liam's playing. He's obviously likes his Irish stuff, his folk Aye. stuff. He does other stuff as well, mm-hmm. but I know you're going to get something different there, yes. right? Then Aye. you go and see Whitty. He's doing something different. He'll do it different, right? Aye. But there will be maybe a, a crossover. Like, oh, there always you know, is because you so, do do it. You always do. It, uh, you've always got a wee bit. I say you've always got. I'm sure you'll standards. be the same. There'll be like the standards. So yeah. if you do, if you do forty songs, mm-hmm. right? I'll guarantee there'll be like twenty of them will be similar to everybody else. Right. Albeit we all play it slightly different. Yeah. Different versions of it, and then you've got that twenty. You've you've got that sort of maybe fifteen of. Yeah. This is different, but still pretty popular. And then you might have a wee five that you're like, I'm just going to throw these uh, in. And, these and there, balls, there eh? may be something that you wouldn't expect. And I think that's why how I got onto that was that when you were talking about playing something that just total tumbleweed, see if you've got that curveball that you throw yeah. in just because you're like, I'm, I like this song, so I'm just going right. to play it just because so I, I like it. And see when you play it and it's mm-hmm. a total like, uh, like I played uh, an end has a start with the editors. And uh, I played it in the, the oak, and you know, just, nobody, nobody's going to know it. Nobody's, nobody's going to know this song. Okay. Or, but uh, then all of a sudden, you get this guy going. You see this wee face just appears <laughs> in the corner of the bar, and he's like, "That's yeah. going to face up, shaking his head." Uh, oh, that's brilliant. I like that. And then comes up to you after the game, goes, "The editor's nice." Do you do? I'm going, I don't think anybody would get that, but uh, you got it first. Time. Do you do requests if somebody comes up? I try. Yeah. I usually preface it by saying, "I'll try." I'll do requests if it's no shite. Right. Like I done a gig, I done, I done a gig the other day, similar to yourself. Uh-huh. I've been doing it long enough. When somebody comes up to request a song, nine times out of ten, I was either going to play it, Aye. or I've played it a million times. That I'm like, ah, that's fine, me bother. I'll fumble my way and, through uh, it. It'll be fine. But there'll be sometimes they'll come up and it, it's so it, they'll request something that's so soul destroying that Aye. I'm like, oh, sorry, me, I've no got it. That's and they, somebody came up the other day, <laughs> and it was the only request I got the whole night, and they said, can you play? Have you ever seen the rain by Credence? And right. I was like, no, oh, sorry, mate, I've not got it. Yeah. Now, obviously, I can play it, but I was just like, I was doing quite an upbeat set. Yeah, so I was like, yeah. this is just going to kill. It's going to kill one then, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And so people didn't like, think that, yeah. Like, in their head, they're like, right, ah, that's right. like my favourite song or whatever. And you go, right, cool. Right. But if I play that now, it's going to ruin what I've spent the last right. half an hour but trying to build up that, a bit. But the other one that irritates energy. me, though, and it's kind of what you just said there, mm. I think people forget. That you're not that you're actually playing this Aye. stuff. You're not jukebox. <laughs> so see when they come up and they go, Martin, go and play blah blah blah, and you go, oh, sorry, pal, I've not got it. How you know? But, but it's easy. Is I, it? I, I, but, but I've, I've still not got it though. Aye. Aye, but it's just A E G or whatever it is. I still don't have it. I still don't have. You know, you need to go away and practice these things. And, or it's when you see when you're playing and you get as when they're especially drunk and Aye. you're playing the cup to, to talk to you. Whilst you're playing, whilst you're playing, eh? and you're like, mate, I'm fucking playing. Yeah, like, see, see the sound that's coming through here. That's me. That playing. is me. If I stop to talk to you, the music stops. Eh? <laughs> but I had, a, I was playing in Linwood, and uh, this wife came up. She was absolutely miraculous. Like Bluetooth could barely stand, and she came up and she's like, oh, can, can you play Kasabian? Or at least I think that's what she said. Yeah. She said can you play Kasabian, and I'm like, but she was like there. Eh? <laughs> of course. While I was saying, can you play Kasabian, and I'm going spitting all over you. Aye, and aye. I'm going right. Okay, aye, aye, right, cool. I'll do it after that, Ken. Aye, so, aye. How you're singing a song, going, aye, I'll do it after this, right, cool. Aye. So you're doing that, and then so I started playing Underdog, 
after that because I thought okay. if I didn't play it, she's going to pester me all night. So I'll play it, keep yep. her happy, and then that that will maybe keep her happy for a wee bit. So I played it, and then she came up heart of life, <laughs> like a quarter of the way through the song. Can you play Kasabian? And I'm like, aye, that's what I'm doing. Aye, yeah. aye, right. And then she went away, came back up again before the end of the song. Play Kasabian. And I thought, right, I've had enough of this. Yeah, I can't deal with this. I, I started taking. I flung out for glassing somebody yeah. just like five minutes after that. So. Is that because they asked for Kasabian? Ah, yeah, I think somebody <laughs> tell her to shut up. <laughs> but I started, like taking, I started taking notes on my phone. I used to like, uh, show my dad uh-huh. and, like all the stupid things that folks say to mm-hmm. your gigs. Uh-huh. And you'll be able to relate to it because every person that does the gigs gets the same oh, thing said, right? Aye, aye, and, yeah, uh, totally. and some of them, I was going in like, so I can remember one time I went in, guy was like, came. I've done two or three songs and mm-hmm. came up and he was like, mate, that sounds terrible, <laughs> <laughs> right? And Thanks he, very much. And he's like, I'm not meaning like, he, he's like, don't know if your guitar's out of tune or something. No, yeah. Obviously it's not out of tune, right? Mm-hmm. But don't know if your guitar's out of tune. So I'm thinking in my head, he's a musician or something. I was like, yeah. oh, do you play a guitar? Oh, no, no, I've, I've never touched a guitar in my life. Yeah. And uh, as Barry Freen, I can't remember what he called it, but he did that thing where you do the pretend. Ah, yeah. Right, yeah. pretend you're, you're changing something. Turning it, dude. Yeah. Two songs later, it comes back up. Much better, mate, much better. Right. But then I had another one, and uh, just wants a wee bit. I had, some, I had somebody that came up. This was only like just maybe the, at the end of last year. Can you do a Johnny Cash song? Mm-hmm. And I was so fucking sick and tired of doing Folsom uh-huh. Prison, right? Because you know it goes doing well, right? Uh-huh. But I was like, I need bother. I was like, I thought I'll do a different Johnny Cash song. Uh-huh. So I thought I'm going to do Hurt. I've never ever play it, uh-huh. but I thought I'm just going to do it, and. Uh, Played the whole song, he stood there the whole time watching me. Yeah. And then, last chord, done it. Hey, there you go, that goes out to the last who's in the front, yeah. blah, blah, blah. I didn't know that song. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. can, you, can you do folks in prison? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, That's sorry, my fault. I've, I've, I've not got it. I uh, always say the two songs I, I, won't, I don't do are Wonderwall and The Gambler. I just can't, I can't. You know what, I some, have done them in the past but very, very occasionally, and for a good reason, because I just... Make you know, want to cry? Aye, the day, aye. I had a, I done a gig... Part of my soul leaves. I done a gig two years ago, and I'm not joking, some, some the guy came up and quit, can you do Wonderwall at the end of this song? Oh, no intention of doing it, I thought, I, I didn't like the song anyway. Aye. If I was ever going to do one as popular, I would rather do Don't Look Back in Anger than mm-hmm. I just don't like Wonderwall. I think, ironically, I think Wonderwall's a great track. It is a tremendous song. It's just probably but a good just, Well, maybe that's what it is. But this guy, I just don't and this is no joke, he requested it after every song for two hours. <laughs> two <laughs> hours in a row, them, after yeah. every song. Play Wonderwall, play Wonderwall. Yeah. And at the end I'm of gone it, in five minutes. At the, oh, end of yeah. it, at the end of it, I done Don't Look Back and <laughs> <laughs> Just to annoy him. But... Uh, <laughs> Aye, so you're obviously, you've been doing your, your pub gigs and all that, uh-huh. but i noticed obviously you've got some videos up, so mm-hmm. you've been doing your Aloha Town Hall, yep. King Tuts, all these places, you're doing your um, your solo gigs, mm-hmm. I'm assuming that, probably like myself, it's just a good way of making extra money and all that, but you're doing covers, it's a bit so destroying, so are you doing your own music as well, with the band? Aye, aye. So, so what's the band called, or is it just, does it go by your name? Aye. Aye, uh, it's just my, so the way it's kind of came about is I've always, like since I was doing the covers, I've, it's always original bands I've been in. I've mm-hmm. never been in like cover, cover bands, bands or anything. That. It's always been original bands. And then when I came back up for Liverpool, I wasn't playing and then I got into the pub thing, kind of fell into it to be yeah, honest. Yeah. Started playing and it was going it was going great and it was, you know, I was earning decent money doing it and so I was just playing all the time. But there was always something missing. Because mm-hmm. I was always used to play more and stuff, write more and stuff. And, uh, I got a wee sort of recording set up and started tinkering with stuff and using it and to write and stuff like that. It was yeah. cool and I was teaching myself how to do that. So I've done that for years, so it was probably the best part of 10 years, you know what I mean? I'd spent gigging doing the pub thing, but at the mm-hmm. same time I'm still recording all my own stuff, writing my own songs, for writing and recording them all. And then lockdown happened. And then I went back through, and I've said this before in the past, but my dad was always at me saying, oh, are you ever going to play these songs? Are you ever going to release yeah, them? Do something or, with or, them. Nah, do something ah. with them. 
So I went back through so the you, hard drives. So are you letting him hear them? Aye. And is he like, you know, they're good tunes. Huh? Why, why are you not doing something with them? Basically, yeah. So I said, right, okay, but well, when lockdown happened, I mean, what else did we have to do? You know what I mean? So I went back mm-hmm. through the old hard drive and I found them and I thought, okay, man, actually, there's some pretty good tunes in there. So I narrowed it down to like 17, mm-hmm. which then got narrowed down further and I re-recorded Aye. them all. So you've them. got 30 songs, you're like, what is the best 12 Aye. out of these? Basically, yeah. Yep. So I narrowed them all down and just sort of re-recorded a rake in them. And then I started putting them out, what, two years ago? I started putting them out, doing the own thing. But when I was going to do it live, I was, you know, needing, if we're going to do it live, I can do it acoustic. The first gig, I'd, solo gig I'd done of my own material was acoustic. Supported Greg Taylor at the Toll booth. Right. And that was the first time I ever played any of the stuff, you know, live. And see then it snowballed for there, eh? See when you're, so see when you're writing the songs? Mm-hmm. Are you writing them on an acoustic? And then... More often than not, yeah. Just, just to start with? Just, yeah. But, so how do you go about writing, as in... You're doing your rock stuff, mm-hmm. right? I might be similar, that a lot of the rock stuff is guitar riff based. Yeah. Right? Aye. So, pre, if I was doing the rock stuff, I'd maybe have three or four guitar riffs that yeah. make up the song. Mm-hmm. I know kind of right, this is sort of rhythm that I'm wanting, this is the drum pattern, that kind of thing. Figure it out that way. And then I can have pretty much the song finished. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the lyrics are an afterthought, as in I I don't want to be an instrumental, so I I need to come up with lyrics. And that's the last thing to do. But since I started doing the pub (coughs) gigs, and I started doing singing and all that, picking up the acoustic a lot more and all of a sudden it's like it's not so much riff based but it's yeah. like it's, it's very much vocal melody based ah, and then somewhere the I'm kind of finding like a wee bit <coughs> a sort of <coughs> in the middle of the two of them mm-hmm. and it's kind of working out quite well so how do you go about writing a song have you got a a method that you use this is kind of how you do it most of the time aye so I mean there's always the oddball that you know comes right, out of, of nowhere yeah, or comes out of something totally different to what you're used to but more often than not it'll be something I'm either playing and I can hear it I can f- I was talking to one of my pals about this the other week and I was playing it this idea of this song and I'm going right I've got this and I'm playing it I don't know what he's hearing but in my head I'm hearing all the parts I'm hearing all the, like, yep. the vocal bit I can hear the drums I can hear this and I'm going oh, that, that's going to be great Aye, that'll be good, I'll do it like that. So I've kind of worked, I work a lot out in my head, almost before I sit down and, mm-hmm. and I'll play the chords, but you know, I'm working a lot of the stuff out in my head. And I sometimes think, it, it, see if it's, see if, it, if it's something that's good, mm-hmm. you'll remember it. Aye. Aye. Like, well, you don't need to record that, everything, hey, you don't need to record everything down to remember it, mm-hmm. if it's good enough. The, the idea you've got, you'll remember, you'll remember you, it. Even more, if you right? only record the chords and right. hum a vocal melody or something, you'll, but you'll remember the other parts. Absolutely, and you, you kind of, you, you do remember a lot of it, and then the beauty of the technology we've got now is that, you know, recording's never been more accessible for, yeah, or for, it's, for it's, everybody. It's, you know? it's easy now it's compared to years so ago. Easy. I mean, it's not easy to do it well, but it's easy to, to get something to down. Get something, to start something. I mean, you mm-hmm. can do it on your phone. You know yeah. what I mean? You just open the thing, press record, and away you go. Yeah. That's your song, and that's your idea, documented forever. So, so see the band you're in the now. Mm-hmm. Well, f- well, first of all, how did you get get the band together? Like, how did you get the other musicians? It's guys I've, I've played with. Well, when I was talking about my first first ever band. Yeah. Uh, it's the bass player that I grew up with. So that, it's uh, just guys that uh, you knew for years. Know, eh? And did you and just Christy basically approach each of them and say, years. "Listen, I've got." They start a band, do you fancy jamming? Mm-hmm. And is it very much a band, even although your name's at the top, is it, it is like pretty much a band? It's gener- generally the way we'll, we'll work it is like I'll do the production side of stuff, write the songs and kind of do the recording side of stuff. See, and then when, when you're, we come to do it live, it's mm-hmm. like, right, what's going on? So see when you're writing the songs, or mm-hmm. how many's in the band? Three. Right, so you go to your rehearsal and there's other three guys setting up you say I've came up with a song mm-hmm. do you show them it this is a song start to finish or I want you to play this I want you to do that or do you you have the idea of the song but do you allow them to contribute 
to make the song yeah, better. Totally. I just I do usually you, do send you steer them. it as in like go and do more mm-hmm. of that, go and do less of that, or do you just trust them that they're good enough with what they yeah. do that, that you know that they're going to provide something that's just what you're wanting? Absolutely. Yep. It's just I just give what I tend to do is re- send the song to them and say like here's a couple of new ones or something that we can fling in the set we can work about where I'm going to put these out and maybe six months this song will come out so it'll be maybe good to are you no micromanaging the, oh, standing no. over the drummer saying no no, no. you do you do the I'm high half five times you know what I mean I'm not that's right. what I said to you're them you're the drummer you, you might send them a demo that he knows the rhythm of it but yeah. you trust him to pick that up and go Just play what you want man I, this is I, I know man. what's going to make this sound better it's funny because I played with Christy the drummer for that long and various different projects different bands that I think I almost instinctively write the drum parts the way he would play it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, I try and... You, I mean, he, he, he cries me some mental things sometimes because he's going, ah, there's a few impossibles in there. Because like, right. you're programming a lot of drums oh, yeah, and things yeah. like that. Hey, I can come up with drum fills that are like impossible to play. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's possible. Well, right, well you can describe it. Just do what you want. Eh? But it's interesting because... Not that I listen back to my own stuff very often, but I've become so. So the only time I hear it is when we play it, mm-hmm. like when we play it live, or in rehearsal or whatever. It's the only time that I actually hear it. And then when I listen back to the recording of it, there's maybe there's there's parts that gets played that I'm just, I just that's just the way the song is now yeah. in my head. And then when I listen back to the recording, it's different. Like there's certain parts I'm missing, mm-hmm. or there's. There's a couple of drum fills or parts, you know, drum fills that he'll do that I just become. It's almost like a cue for me now, like yeah. to play it live. When I hear this drum fill, I know what's coming. It's funny you say that. But, but the drum fill's not actually yeah. in this in the recording. If you ever listen yeah. to it, it's funny you say that though, because I've done a few albums, right? Mm-hmm. And I like doing it at eight songs an album, right? I don't know if it's the old school thing of four on one side, four, four on the other side. Four, uh, right, I just like eight. It just seems to be a good number. That's the number, right? Yeah. But. Uh, I can spend a year mm-hmm. working on it. And see, the minute it's recording finished, mm-hmm. I might not listen to it again for years. 100%. Man. You've I, I, it's it's, it's it almost like I, times, I need so. to get these out of my head. Right. But see, once they're out, I don't need to listen to them again. I'm quite happy that, that they're done. A piece but for a while, but you do, you then start playing them. And it's almost like you're, you're remembering them slightly different from the way you wrote them. Mm-hmm. So as you see, you, you maybe listen back to the original and go, oh, I actually do that vocal line slightly different mm-hmm. live. It's, but then you see that with big bands as well. 100%. You know, they've been playing songs for 20 or 30 years. They, it, it's not exactly the same as the album version because no. they've got used to playing it a certain a way. A different way, yeah. And whether it's on purpose mm-hmm. or whether they're just editing it because it's like, listen, you know, if I had the chance to do it again, I'd probably record it differently or write it. Well, I heard Kelly Jones saying that in an interview before that when he wrote, you know, when especially the early stuff, you know, when he when he done it, when they recorded it, that was kind of the first time he'd sung a lot of it, mm-hmm. and he would do it all in two or three takes. Yep. And you're like, right, that's great. And afterwards, you know, when he's listening to it and he's playing afterwards, the recording's done, records out. Mm-hmm. Number one, as they've got a habit of doing. Yeah. So, out, number one, there it goes, records out. He's listening back to it and he's playing it live and going, I would do that differently. Oh, you know, right. I should have done this, I should have done that. And I think that's part of, that's a big obstacle, you know, for a lot of songwriters and a lot of, me as well, I constantly need to correct myself and, because I do it all the time, yeah. I'm my own worst enemy for it, but you want everything to be perfect. But the problem with that is, is that if you keep trying to change it and tweak it and make it perfect, nobody will ever hear it. Oh, right. You know, you'll what, never put it out, you'll never release it. What about, one of the problems I found mm-hmm was with home recording, mm-hmm. you get so used to, you layer everything, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. And it's great fun doing it. Ah, it's brilliant, man. But the amount of times I've been, when I get to the end process, I'm like, I've never played this song on the guitar and vocals start to finish. No. I've, I've, I've sang it uh-huh. by itself, I've, I've played the guitar by itself, but you find yourself, done you've whole done thing. the whole thing, yeah. and you're like, if someone was to say, go and pick the guitar up and play that now, I'd be like, Oh, I'm not actually yeah, sure yeah. if I can do that. I've got a new practice. Which one of the 35 guitar parts that's on it do you want me to play? Aye, dude, so are you are you a bit like that? Oh, aye, aye. As in, when you're playing with the band, I used to you've be, got yeah. to practice because you've maybe not wrote it as in, I'm just sitting, aye. singing this start to finish. Mm-hmm. 
you're so used to recording everything individually and yep. wearing it up that you've maybe never actually sat and just uh, jammed it. I haven't. That was that was one of the most interesting things about when I first put out the the first EP or the singles in the first EP and then we started playing live. It was interesting because I had to try and figure out how to play it mm -hmm. because you fall into that trap at the home recording, you're sitting in front of the, the laptop yeah. and you, or your computer or whatever and you've got the guitar and you can do whatever you want. You can yeah. do anything and you can put as many guitars on it as you want and you put like a million guitar layers on it and it sounds massive and then you've got to play it with a three piece band and you're like, oh, how am I going to do this? Or it's even just the, the guitar part, mm -hmm. playing it as a guitarist, fine. The vocal part as a vocalist, fine. So you try and do the two of them together. It might be that the vocals, the vocals don't follow the same rhythm as the aye, guitar, aye. and it's, it turns out difficult. It's hard, aye. aye it's, so uh, that was interesting. I actually enjoyed that, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. But I, it did change how how I record, how I approach recording. Like the new stuff, I'm going to put out some new stuff in the next, or start releasing some more stuff in the next couple of months. Right. So see your. Um, so the process, the whole process has changed. Like I actually write. So rather than have like say twenty guitar tracks and you put them, mix them all together and get this enormous big sound, mm -hmm. you can do that with a lot less. Yeah, and that's what I do now. It's like this double tracked guitar. I've just got better at recording now, so mm -hmm. it sounds bigger than it did back then. So it's yeah. just it's practice, practice, yeah. I suppose. Eh? But I write that. I oft, I think I write songs now differently than I did before so I write them with you'd that in mind. You'd like to think as well though that I mean you think back to when you're a teenager mm -hmm. pretty cringy the songs that you first songs oh, that, right, that you right. write but you'd like to think as, as time goes on you get better as an actual songwriter. Well the best songwriters tell you that eh? even though the big Nashville guys will tell you that you know, they'll write you know a tune or two a day mm -hmm. most of them are murder and they, they never see the light of day you know what I mean most of them are, are not good it's and they'll only like maybe eight, seven, eight, nine of their songs out of ten that they write in a week will go in the bin, mm -hmm. or at least live on a hard drive and never see the light of day. But they'll have one or two that they're like, "Aye, that's about." So is writing a song a quick process for you? And I, I don't mean recording the whole thing, but I, I always use like so you, you're playing at the Sherman's gig uh -huh. next month with Scott Ashworth. Yep, perfect example, right? Guy does my head in because, <laughs> because I go and make myself a cup of tea and I come back he's wrote like another three songs and I'm uh, like, for fuck's sake mate, I was like, uh, <laughs> like no. he's just got this knack, uh, uh, it's, the, it's the, clear, he eh? picks the guitar up, comes up with a wee melody, he's maybe got an idea that he's been thinking about, uh -huh. but he, he's very, very quick, uh -huh. right? I've done songs where, I, I've had songs where it took me like a year mm -hmm. to finish them and but then I've gave myself a challenge. I've done a couple, a few EPs ago. My challenge was I'm only going to do three or four songs. Mm -hmm. If I can't have this, the basic song written within ten minutes, I'm scrapping. I'm scrapping it and going on. So I can do both. I can mm -hmm. write stuff really quickly if I'm in the right frame of mind. Mm -hmm. There's other ones that, that take a bit of work. For yourself, mm -hmm. are you a certain way with songwriting? Uh, I think that. Uh the good ones always come quick, I think. Not too, uh, it, almost like if you overthink it, uh, it's, it's going to take and I think longer or not work. I don't, I, not I all the time. Uh, like the, the newer stuff that I've done as well, it, it's kind of taken a different turn, so that was heavily, heavy influenced by all that kind of guitar stuff in the early 2000s and that, and one of the, one of the first albums I bought was Dookie, the Green Day album, mm -hmm. and it was tremendous, I loved it. And, the stuff that I, when I find that I'm actually writing, the stuff that comes out is very like sort of Foo Fighters, Green Day, well, early Stereophonics type stuff. You know, it's just it's basic I, guitar. I, I was listening to your to your stuff earlier today, uh -huh. the Alloa Town Hall. Aye, aye. And it was to me, to my ear, I was like, this sounds like this sounds like see if somebody had got Travis, uh -huh. but told them, right, come on, get this distortion up, guys, right, and then crossed it with the first Foo Fighters album. Aye. That's what it sounded like to me, like I kind of crossed those two. Right, aye. And, uh, That's kind of, uh, and... So it was think, quite a cool, a cool wee sort of mix of both. Aye. And I think what, what my problem has been, I say problem, you know, I just, I, I think I, 
second guess myself too much, but I think what the problem I see with, with it is that I'll get this idea and it sounds great, and I go, oh, that sounds brilliant, but I try and change my mind, like I try and do more, I try and right. change it to go, aye, but it sounds too much like this, or it sounds too much like that, or, yep. you know, it doesn't matter what song you listen to, you'll find something it sounds like, eh? Yeah. You're not the first person to play those three chords and sing that melody over the top. I remember you know my, I mean? my cousin came to me, he was learning the guitar, and he's like, I, I wrote my first song. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I was like, right, let me hear it. He's playing it, and I'm like, I recognise that. Uh-huh. And I'm like, right, keep playing it. Uh-huh. I was like, mate, that's summer of 69. He's like, oh, damn, that's what it is. <laughs> I know. So, but what I found is that I, now I actually, I didn't second guess it. Eh? All oh. the new stuff, I'll write it if I'm happy with it and I like it. And I go, right, that's, cool. that, that's good. So, but what you find though is though, you might think in your head, it sounds like this, but seeing you introduce the three, the three other guys yeah. and they all start introducing yeah. their parts to it, it can change it completely. Uh-huh. For, for in, in a good way. Aye. Right, but see, um, it's a fun, just uh, before, uh-huh. uh, there's an interesting thing that happened just when we were talking about that. That uh, I had, I wrote this song, and I had this melody over the top of it. I'm going, ah, that's it. It's going to be great, and I can hear it in my head. I'm going, right, big, yep. big vocals, big backing vocals, and all that, and a big chant and everything. It's going to be great. And I thought, but it sounds like something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay? It sounds like some. I sent that recording that I had on my phone to just about everybody I know and go, what song is that? Mm-hmm. What song is that? And they're going, I they can, but it sounds like something. Ah, I've heard that before, I've heard it before. Maybe they could tell me what it was. Right, okay. I've heard that before and I sent it to Sean and Sherman and he went, it sounds like an AD and an E, mate. Just play it, sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, fair enough, Stop man. Stop overthinking it. Basically, aye. So what, I went, oh, no, what cheers, about, um, what do. So you're talking guitars, music and all that. What about, your, what about lyrics, right? So, do, do you write them last? Yes. Right? Every time. And, so see if I was to, to get a hold of your lyrics, mm-hmm. for whatever, like the last song you wrote, mm-hmm. if I was to read them without hearing the music or anything, would I know what you're talking about? As in, d- uh, does it tell a story that's pretty obvious what you're talking about, or is it quite vague? You know, I know everybody takes something different away from a song, mm-hmm. but could I read that and go, right, you're talking about this and then this happens and then this happens, or is it a bit more vague than that? What, what do you think your lyrics are like? I, I, I personally think they're quite obvious, but that's because I know what they're about. Mm-hmm. So like, did other guys in the band ever ask you? No? Nah, they've, they've never mentioned it. But I would because think that they're relatively straightforward, you know. I don't, I'm no, uh, I don't go in for the whole writing complicated, fancy lyrics and try yeah. trying to overcomplicate things. Yeah. I think the best things are, you know, they're pretty straightforward and they're pretty to the point. I mean, yeah. there was a big '90s rock band, mm-hmm. metal band called White Zombie. Mm-hmm. Rob Zombie was the singer, uh, and when he was writing, um, talking about writing, he would write like. A, Pretty obvious story of what, yeah. whatever it was, but then he would t- he would edit it and take bits out, mm-hmm. so it, it then turned into like almost like a, a snapshot, like headers. Yeah. So it wouldn't be quite as obvious. Yeah. When you're reading through it, right? But then, completely f- flip side to that, I remember Noel Gallagher talking about about writing, and he'd be like, I don't know what this all means. He doesn't right? care. Or not. He says, Oh yeah, almost to the point he's like. I don't, I don't need to know it's the melody, what it means. Yeah, right. says, all I know is, is, is that it means something to all the people when they're singing it back to me. Yeah. So, you know, that word rhymes with that word, but I don't know what it means. It takes pressure off a bit though, doesn't it? But do you, you think, think lyrics are important? Yes and no. I think depending on, depending on the setting, depending on the type of song. The style maybe? I think maybe the style, maybe it could be like... like for example, you, you look at pop music mm-hmm. nowadays, right? Doesn't it matter? Pop the lyrics, the lyrics in pop music matter. is irrelevant. You, you could be singing anything. It, it just needs to be something that's catchy that fits over the song, yeah. right? But you've got other other bands where it's like it's all based around the lyrics. Yeah, man. It, 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 you know, I don't personally like. I, I had this uh, discussion with my better half. She was saying that she listens to music very differently to what I do. Mm-hmm. Which I find fascinating that people can listen to the same thing, but they all take something different away from it. Yeah, like you will all listen to it differently, even mm-hmm. though it's the same sound. 
Yeah. We all listen to it differently. But I listen, I'm a very, I think I'm very instrumental and melody driven. Like, so I, I listen to this, the music as such and the melodies. I don't know what half the words mean. You know, or I, I don't even know the lyrics. You know, I could sing you the song, I could sing you the melody and all yeah. that, and that'd be great. But the lyrics, pff, I still get lyrics. I get my own lyrics wrong, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. But she listens to it differently. She listens, she remembers the lyrics more than the music. But yeah. I'm the opposite way around. So a couple of bands I really like, The Doors mm-hmm. and Pearl Jam, Aye. right? Very, very, the, the lyrics yeah, they've are... They've got new su- stuff, eh? But the, ly- the lyrics are super important. Yeah. Right? Whereas you might listen to some of the rock stuff, but because of the type of singing, you, you, you can't even hear what they're saying or that, or Aye. it might just... Some of the rock stuff's really silly, mm-hmm. you know, because it just... It's, it's based on a theme or that, and then it just depends maybe what, what kind of style it is. I, I personally like the lyrics to mean something, mm-hmm. but then, as you say, it's some people will listen to it and they'll go, I like that song, and they couldn't care less about the lyrics. I think, I think it's maybe do, yeah. individual think, preferences, I suppose. Yeah, and I think it is, yeah, and it depends what you've... Almost depends what frame of mind you're in. So I've got a couple of songs, yeah. There was one in particular on the EP, a tune called Close Your Eyes, it was quite, it was very difficult to write just because of what it's about and how personal it is to, and I think still I've only ever played it live like three times because I can't. I but can't then what's amazing though is somebody else could listen to that and it could mean something completely different totally. to them, mm-hmm. but that's the beauty of music. Absolutely, it's yep. very subjective and I remember that. I had a, not an argument, let's call it a heated discussion with somebody <laughs> at uh, somebody at uni or college and it was uh, it was quite because <laughs> I got a shite mark in one of my uh, one of my music essays yep. and uh, they said nah, that, that's not what this means that's not what that means and I got on my high horse basically like <laughs> but that's what it means to me it's just mm-hmm. like being stubborn and arguing the yeah. point but that's what but but there is it, a point there, it, though. It raised an interesting point, though, eh? It's like, you're, market, you're giving me, like, a, a, a grade, a definitive grade, mm-hmm. based off of your subjective opinion of, of something, of yeah. a piece of music, or of a genre, or a style of music, or something like that. You're giving me a definitive grade off of your subjective opinion. That's my subjective opinion that's written down, so why is my opinion di- any better or worse than yours? How can you even mark it? Exactly, yeah. that was my point. Had I got an A or a, even a B even or a e, even a pass, I'd have been like, "Ah, cool." I wouldn't have even had that yeah. argument. I because. think I maybe had the same. The same. I think I maybe had the same discussion. This was way back in high school because uh-huh. I, I done higher music, right. right? And I can always remember there was a section of the exam, mm-hmm. and it was we're going to play you this piece of music, normally a classical piece, right? Mm-hmm. And it'd be like. It would be to the. I think the the idea was remember that old the old poem like Tam O'Shanter mm-hmm. and it would be I can't really quite remember the story but there's a guy riding home on the horse and mm-hmm. which grabs the horse's tail or something, something like that right but it was like right for each section of the story you've got to say this is the bit in the music that relates to that bit in the right. story but then they would they would mark it right or wrong and I'm like but hold on yeah. that bit to me, it is to me yeah. indicates that part of the story but it might be different for that person, it might be different That's for that person. That's the last person. thing about music though, isn't it? Aye. It's all different and it's all it all affects us all differently and and just to illustrate that point, there's a piece of music. I had a music teacher at Alpha Academy, Mr. Gordon, who's sadly uh, passed away last year, but he played this piece to us and I couldn't even tell you what it was, it was horrible. Mm-hmm. It was disgusting. It was like two minutes of pure dissonance and basically like it's not scene in Jaws where the guy scratches the board. Maybe big one of my songs. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you could write a song this bad, I'd be impressed, man. But that's a special. But it's it was horrible. It was disgusting. And he played it really loud in the class one day. And he says to us, "What's that song about?" And we're all going, "I have no idea. That's not even a song. It's not a thing. It's, yeah, it's just noise. dissonance and noise." Yeah, yeah. But it was written by someone to sort of, I mean this is this is quite a dark subject like, but it's it's written about uh, the last minutes of the end of World War Two, basically, mm-hmm. when they dropped the bombs. And this is sort of this artist's representation of what it sounded like mm-hmm. at that moment. 
And I thought, that is, how does somebody listen? How does somebody even get that idea and come up with this sound? But they can listen to it and take that for it. Mm-hmm. But I can't. And it's just that it fascinates me how, how subjective it is and how, but then it's amazing how, how things affect different people. It's amazing how you write songs, though, because I, I remember speaking with my dad a lot and my dad would, he didn't play, he, he loved music, mm-hmm. didn't play music or anything, didn't, you know, couldn't play or that. And he was always fascinated. How can you write a song from nothing? Mm-hmm. Right? And I would say to him, listen, I can be driving in the car listen to a bit of music and, and it might be that I turn it on halfway through the song and mm. you, you hear something different, mm. different, differently or you just hear a little snippet of a guitar melody or a riff or there might be one little bit of lyric. Mm-hmm. I said, that can that, that alone can go into my mind and I can write an entire song based around that. Now, yep. The song I write doesn't relate to, to, to the other song, it doesn't sound like it, but it can just it was trigger something in my mind that causes that, but then he was an artist, mm-hmm. right? So I'm like, well, it's the same. You, you can buy a canvas, mm-hmm. and then three weeks later, you've got a whole picture made mm-hmm. that you've made from your mind. It's the same idea, uh-huh. only it's with music. Yep, I totally agree. It's when I mean, they say that, eh? you take for one person, and you know you're stealing. Yep. But if you steal for everybody, it's research. Yeah? You know, it's right. that. That's kind of the way it is. It's you. You're listening to all these. You listen to music constantly, and it goes in, whether or not you're consciously aware of it. It's in there somewhere, Aye. and then you get a spark. It and call it inspiration. It just appears. You know, it's been twenty years in the making. That thing's been rattling about in your head, and then all of a sudden, it's got a context, and it comes out, and it goes, ah, oh, right, there it is. And then you're equipped as a songwriter or a producer or whatever it is to go right. That's what I want. That's Aye. the sound I want, and you make it a thing. It becomes a thing, but. You know, I, I don't think it's ever, I don't think it ever comes out of nothing, comes out of nowhere. I think it's a... It's already in there. It's in there somewhere, it just needs to come out. I just, I think most of the time if it just appears, Aye. that's the best one. Because I think a lot of the best songs, uh, certainly the ones I like, you know, the ones I've done, I just, I've had a t- song that I just finished this afternoon actually, I just mm-hmm. finished tracking it and mixing it and stuff this afternoon. And I've had that song for years. And it started off as more or less what it is now, mm. like what it is this, as of this afternoon, the finished version. Yep. If I'd have played you that song six months ago, you wouldn't have recognised it, it was totally different. So I got it and I went down that rabbit hole of saying, yep. nah, it needs to be this, it needs to be that. Yep. More guitars, more guitars, more this, more that. Let's put synths on it, because yep. we need synths, right, cool. Or let's try let's, it at nah, least. Let's put a string section on it. What, mm-hmm. Why do I need a string section on it? Anyway. Yep. I've went, I've went that way, and then I've brought it right back to basically what it started as. And I go, no, that's it. That's the sound. So see with your band as well, what are you looking for in your band? So you're obviously a, a, a rock guy, mm-hmm. right? You like a lot of the same bands probably that I like. Now, what I like about the, the rock bands is they, they go on stage. Now, you've obviously got to have the tunes, yeah. right? But they look like they're having the time of their life. Absolutely. When they're up there, right? The, the, you know, they're moving about the stage. The, 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 they're they're interacting with the crowd. That they're, they're loving being there. Yeah. They're, they're performing. They're, yeah. they're absolutely loving it. And I suppose it's not for everybody. But what I really disliked, especially about, I never got into the Brit pop thing because I was always more into yeah. the rock stuff. They all look bored, like they, like they didn't want to be there. They stand on the spot, they mm. stare down at their guitar and they're playing the... Why are you doing it? it you know what I mean? Like they, and when you hear them, mm-hmm. they sound just as good as the album version. They might even actually sound better. Mm-hmm. But they look like they wish they were anywhere other than there. Yeah. And you still, I still... I, 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 like I've got a friend who's a massive Noel Gallagher fan. Mm-hmm. And he went to see him in concert a couple of years ago. And I mean, this, this guy loves him, but he was just like, it was crap. Yeah. He's like, sounded brilliant, mm-hmm. but they looked like they were just sleeping. Right. There was no energy or nothing. Yeah. With your band that you've got in the go, do you kind of, I don't mean that you purposely do it, but you're obviously influenced by all the other bands that, mm-hmm. that you like. So is that kind of the way you are like, you know, 
Well, let's go out and rock this let's place. We, it, man, we, we own the stage. 100%, man. And uh, there's no sort of like, do this, don't do that. Blah, blah, blah. No, no. Just do you, man. Eh? All right. Go out there and just do your thing. All We've right. got the songs, but, you know, like I said before, it's it's the recording is the recording, but, you know, live, it's pretty, I mean, do your thing. If there's some cool part that you want to add in. It's to, to go for it. Uh, you want to change the bass line, change the bass line, yeah. you know, put drum fills in, just go wild, man. And then when we're when we're playing, we kind of do that anyway. You know, it's just kind of like it's a gig. It's having a, fun. It a, you're there enjoying yourself, eh? And it just it's funny because we we played at a uh, depot, which is in Falkirk, but it's the old the old uh, uh, Martell. Martell. We played there. Supported uh, Vida mm-hmm. there last year, maybe the beginning of last year. Mm-hmm. Anyway. We got up. It's quite a high drum riser, eh? It's, it's probably about the height of this table. Okay. How I got up there, I don't know. But yeah. I turned around at one point in, in uh, one of the tunes, and the bass player's up on the drum riser. So I thought, I'm going to follow. <laughs> That's a good idea. So I got up on the drum riser with a, light, with a gold top Les Paul on. And I turned round, and it was at that point where I turned round and looked down and went, "Oh, that's a long way down." And, and you carry no step like, doing like nah, that pussy. Nah, man. <laughs> I've got it. I've committed now. Eh? I've got to go for it. So it was a, with a light, a gold top Les Paul on as well. I thought I'm looking down, going, oh, f- "Right, yeah, you've got to come nah. Buy these. This is how it ends. You know what yeah. I mean? This is going to be somehow got like, down. And I was you're just thinking in your head. Then he look like an arse. Uh, <laughs> this is going to hurt me, this is going to be horrible. Yeah. So I hit the deck and it was fine. It was great. But that's the kind of that's the kind of thing I like. Eh? You know, it's it's live. It's you're supposed to be enjoying it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You want to look like you're having. You, you want to have the time I want, I, I, want the, I want the audience to enjoy it. Of course. How can they enjoy it if I don't? Right. You know what I mean? So we're early on in 2024. Mm-hmm. What have you got planned for the rest of the year? I have. I've just finished up recording. More or less. Is this so, like an EP, uh, an album, well, it's or going is this to be individual a, tracks? It's going to be a series of singles, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, put it out as individual tracks. And I like albums, but the reality is that it costs so much, you know, mm-hmm. to and to put out s- something. I mean, it, it costs nothing to put something out. It's a lot, a lot of time. But to it, do it properly, it, it costs a lot of money. It's one of those things. I think maybe costs a lot of money there's a lot of time involved it takes up every every minute that you've got and what I've tended to find in the past is which is why I haven't really released anything for the last wee while because I put out you know a couple of tra- maybe three four tracks in a year and I was building up this momentum and I put out the EP and it was cool mm-hmm. and then I didn't have anything to back it up with yep. and I was like oh. I said because I'd said I wasn't going to do that because that was my experience with before but I found myself doing that. Eh? Mm-hmm. I f- fell into the, the trap again. Build up all this momentum, and then you've nothing to back it up with. And if you're no constantly, the, I mean, the harsh reality of it is is that if you're not in people's faces and in their ears all the time, you know, yeah. they are. Yeah, totally. And they could be your pals, but if you're no, if if you're no yeah. got something new for them to listen to, they might be your pal, but you know what I mean. They'll get bored. Eh? So I was, do, I was, I done. Albums, I had all these songs Aye. in my head. Done for like three albums, so yeah. you're talking 24 songs, like right? eight songs each album, right? I got so bored with that format uh-huh. that the last two years I've done three EPs mm-hmm. and I've only got to focus on three or four songs, Aye. right? And the other thing I found though is you write, well, what I was doing is I'd do eight songs yeah. and see once you've lived with those eight songs. Is we can record them for six months. All of a sudden, actually, I've only got six songs here because two of them Aye. I would normally scrap. But you've you've now started it, so you need to kind of finish Aye. it. Whereas you can, I kind of feel like if I'm doing three or four songs, I can focus. I can get this done, start to finish, mm-hmm. and I know what I'm doing. But everyone's probably a couple of years behind. You know, like a year or two behind as well. Like you're playing, like I'm playing songs that they're new and I was saying this to Nikki I was letting her, her hear them this afternoon and uh, she says are these new mm-hmm. and I went uh, no they're, they're kind of old and she's going I've not heard that one before so it's new and I says no it's not it's ah, you but, wrote it uh, ages ago but you've only just uh, got round to the it. it's new to everybody except me yeah, yeah. You know I mean to me this that's like two year old mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm bored of it already mm-hmm. and I wanted the next one and I want the next and everybody thinks their, their newest song is the, the best thing they've ever done 
better than everyone. Right. So you always get that excitement and that sort of confidence in your new songs and you just want to play all your new ones. Right. But you forget that you've got a whole catalogue, all, uh, almost a whole catalogue of stuff, you know what I mean, that people have never heard. You've been, you've been really excited about that at one point in time. Yeah. You, you are no longer because there's a new shiny toy to play with but right. nobody else has heard those songs so I'm at the point now where I've got all those written and recorded and we're going to start rolling them out we've what? got some live stuff with the Shermans mm -hmm. to play we've got some other live stuff in the pipeline just now what about see your own songs as well mm -hmm. what about is artwork, artwork important to you because it's one of those things see me growing up mm -hmm. Obviously, I grew up. I, I was already like twenty before like the millennium mm -hmm. came around and that, and the internet and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So you would go into a shop and you you would buy an album sometimes just based, based on the album on cover, artwork, what yeah. it looked like. So to me, it was really important, and the order that they were played in was important, mm -hmm. and the wee booklet and yeah. reading all this stuff and that. And it's obviously over the years there'll be generations now. Artwork, what you talking about? Yeah. Got, that's got lost because you just stream it. Or you yeah. watch it on YouTube, or you do this or that. Never seen is that either. is something like that important to you still, or yeah, you put you put effort into it, but it's not as important. No, it's not a deal breaker for me. You know, if if I've not got the artwork ready, <coughs> I do like to. I, I mean, you're not just going to put anything there. No, but you're not going to spend six months trying no. to figure out the, the ultimate album cover. No, no, because it's especially because it's singles. You know what I mean? It's like. It's, it's almost easier, you know, in a lot of ways with the singles because when you're doing an album, you're trying to think, you know, is it, are you basing the artwork on the theme of the album? What, yeah, yeah. What, what's that about? How like, does it all link how together? How does it all link together? Or is it something totally abstract? Or is it what? I don't know. But with a the single, there's usually a specific, you know, what's the song about? Mm -hmm. Right, well, yeah. that's the image I see in my head when I think about it. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think a lot in that way, especially when I'm writing as well. I'll think of it like, it's almost like a script, like you know, you think of a, I can picture it in my head and then I write out this, just like what you were saying about uh, The World Zombie as well, and you take wee bits out and go, right, I didn't need that, mm -hmm. they say, you know, you write out your story and go, nah, I didn't need that, I didn't need that, I can say it in all these headers and that's cool, but in your head you've got, a, I can picture it, you know, I can remember what I'm talking about or, or even if it's a, Fictional song, you know. Yeah, yeah. Songs then I think people forget that, you know, songs then need to be based on something real. Ah, right. It doesn't need to be it doesn't need to have happened to you or someone you know, it could be a completely fictional Might just event. Be watching the television, Maybe. come up with an idea. You write something about something you've seen on the telly or listen about something that somebody's told you or whatever. Book read or about aye, aye, anything. It could be anything. So you write this thing but I'm assuming it's the same for everybody else, but you know, when you're thinking about something like that and you're you're, you're going over it or you're reading something, you picture it in your mind. Eh? Mm -hmm. So you're picturing a story and a scene and all this, that and the other thing. So I try to write like that, mm -hmm. you know, try and describe that scene and then try and, and then you take bits out and you go, I can say that without that bit and, you know. And where are you, are you releasing your stuff? So I try and do the artwork, sorry, to, to, to mention the artwork, but I try and make the artwork similar to that picture that I see in my head yeah. when I do that. And are you releasing your songs um, like iTunes, Spotify, like, or are you, are you old school still getting hard copies like CDs? I get some, aye. I do get some. What, I, what I'll tend to do is uh, I'll release it, I'll release like what I did with the last one. I'll release a load of them, you know, as singles. Mm -hmm. And then I'll kind of package them together as an EP. Yep. And then I'll get a hard physical copy of the EPs. Mm -hmm. You know, the singles I'll put out one song, so you're kind of almost no point in. Because I was laughing with ba Barry Frame, uh -huh. right? He was on a few episodes ago, and we were talking about Scott Ashworth's aye. album, right? Because I was joking, saying this twenty five years in the aye, aye, aye. <laughs> So I was joking. I was joking with him, saying this took forever, and uh, the album sounds great, though, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Love right. it. Right, but uh, what I was saying was, he obviously releasing it through iTunes, yeah. Spotify, all the, all the usual bits and pieces online, but he was also getting physical copies. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> he was getting physical copies, right? And uh, I don't know if it's because of how I grew up. I still like that. Yeah, man. I, right? I like that. But um, 
It was that thing where Scotty got you through and, he, and he'd been putting stuff up on social media. This is the artwork and I'm yep. looking at it. Okay, there's the front picture, there's the inside picture, the back picture. Mm-hmm. It all blends together well. It's looking really good. Mm-hmm. Got it all through. I contacted him, right, I want a copy. I want one of your CDs and all that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Barry had messaged him, How, how's it sound? I've not, I've not heard it yet. I, I'll come round to yours because mm-hmm. Barry had spent like 10 years mixing it. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> and uh, he goes round and... Sounds great, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> and he comes in and he goes, eh, how is it? He's like, ah, I've not got a CD player. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm like that. That's another thing you didn't think about. There's loads aye, of people in totally. who didn't have a CD player. Aye, aye absolutely. And even, a, even people like to have it. But even, even if you go, if you get a car now, uh-huh. it used to be, well, standard, there's always going to be a CD player or that. Aye. You're getting, well, aye, now you've got, you, you got to go and get a wee USB uh, stick. Plug well, it there's in. There's a, a funny story that <clears throat> I've just got a car, just last this year last year I think I've had it about a year yep and it's the first car I've ever had that hasn't got a CD player but that's the same my last, one, my last one only had a CD player yeah so I couldn't have listened to Spotify or anything like that on my phone uh, it had to be CDs so I got really into this band about two and a bit years ago Dirty Honey mm-hmm. who are uh, from LA but they had this this song came on I loved it it was brilliant and their EP came out mm-hmm. and I loved that as well and I wanted to listen to it in the car so right. I was like right I'll buy a CD and then I could put the CD in the car <laughs> yep then they do CDs you know what's funny they didn't do C- they did not have a CD for sale and I even said so on the website we don't have CDs for sale everything is on like yeah. Amazon and all that uh, iTunes and Spotify and that and I'm going that's great but I was I felt like I'm like the dinosaur eh like the car yeah. <laughs> just because of my well, what's shitty funny, car the, the, the last car that I got Mm-hmm. I still got some. I've still got CDs kicking about. So, get an album that I really like. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go and get the new car today. We take his album so that I can right, test, play it. It'll be test, the first out, album. test out the sound system. Aye. Get into it. Wait, where's the CD player? Oh, there's no, there is no one. <laughs> I don't know if you did this, but see, if you ever went into like into Stirling or wherever, and you went to like HMV or Virgin Europa, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, wherever. And you come out with your new CD and you're like, right, this is brilliant. And you get, you buy like maybe three or four CDs and you get back into the car. I remember getting into the car park in the Thistle Centre and you're sitting there with this bag of CDs and you're mm. like, what one am I going to put on first? Oh, yeah. This is going to be great. And then you pick one and then you listen to it to death and then you put the next one on. And it's a whole, it's a thing. It's similar to like how I remember my dad talking about going and buying a record. Like he would go on like a Saturday or whatever oh, yeah. and he would go to Europa like when Europa was in Alloa mm-hmm. you buy like a record yep. and it was like a big thing you know you go and you buy this record and you've got this thing now I remember and then all the way home and then you go and you put it on and you sit and you listen to it and you read it and you what you know it's, it's so a remember, thing that remember, doesn't really exist anymore I remember my dad talking about that uh-huh. so he when he was like 18, 19 started working through in Glasgow uh-huh. and he says there was a music shop on Sucky Hall Street right. so he says he would go there you know you you I don't know if it's a music magazine, but you would mm-hmm. find it like all oh, your favourite band got a new album coming out. You'd go down, you'd uh-huh. you'd have to order it. Uh-huh. And he says you'd go in, there'd be like station set up, so you put the headphones uh-huh. on, so you could you listen, listen to it. it uh-huh. But he's saying there was nothing nothing <coughs> cooler back then. Obviously, it was all records, uh-huh. but you would buy it. And back then, a lot of time and effort went into the album cover. Yeah. Walking home, he says, with under your arm, and folk yeah. could see you holding this record. And uh-huh. he says you you get. That's how you get talking to people because uh, they go, oh, what you got? What you got? Uh, that? Oh, I love the Who or whatever uh, it was, and they'd start uh, chatting away. There's still that visual aspect to music, though. That there I is think something that's nice about it. And what? But so people didn't cover as much. Do you have band merchandise? Yeah. As in, like, do you have t-shirts made? Yeah. Aye. Because that is another. One. That is another sort of visual part to it. Aye, absolutely. Well. So I've got the. I've got stuff. Should have brought you one. I'll send you one. I'll get one sent over. That's on camera. You can get it. <laughs> uh, fuck, I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> uh, uh, I, so I got them. I kind of mainly got them. It was almost an afterthought, to be honest. Isn't it? But as it is, when you're playing gigs, listen, we've got, I, you totally, just got I, your wee advertisement uh, before the last song. But what, what's, what's interesting, right, is when I was, it was coming towards the end of the lockdown, I think maybe, and I had booked this gig at the toll booth by uh, Greg Taylor, and I was like, right, I'm going to, I've got to do something yeah. and then I was watching this YouTube video with a band called Massive Wagons mm-hmm. who do uh, they, they've done this whole thing through through lockdown you know this kind of video series talking about what it's like to be in a band and yep. how to do this how to do that and the other thing 
and I was listening to them and they were talking about merch mm-hmm. and the guy said uh, he says stop like you, you think you're one of those nah we didn't do merch we didn't need merch or something you know, you're you just going to rely on your music t-shirt. alone Aye. Or, or, you, or you feel like you feel embarrassed about it or something you know like oh I can't do it. who's got to buy a t-shirt with my name on it type yeah. thing and he's like stop doing that just do it Right. Black T-shirt, do your band name. If nothing else, just do those two things. Sell it at gigs. Sell it on your website. People will buy it. Be like Wayne's World. That walk, walk about advertising your own show. Totally. Aye. <laughs> and that's it. That's it. You got a show called Pete and Diesel, yeah. and uh, that's your. Uh, but that's a band. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they do it. The rest of them I obviously see. That's it. But they have. Uh, I just stop doing it. Just, just put it out. You know, like do, do a t-shirt, put it out, because people yep. will buy it. And um, it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole revenue st- like stream as well for a band. You know, but like, yeah, there's not a lot of money in original material, mm-hmm. unless well, you, that, unless you've got, a, unless you've got a following. Yeah, like selling you? merch can turn a gig or a tour, make it worthwhile. N- you can make it profitable. Yeah, you can at least yeah. break even with it. But what's even more even interesting? Even more so, probably you probably find you maybe end up selling more t-shirts than that than actual Aye. CDs or albums. Aye. I mean, it's always nice to have them anyway. Yeah. Most people probably access it online. Aye. People will buy it just because they want to support you, I think. Well, CDs. People like buying a t- Look, Aye. I like buying a t- I, I, like buying to, a t- I go to see a band, I'm always looking to get a tour t-shirt. Aye, me too. And, uh, that's and then this, you, you that's can what this is, eh? Aye. Yeah, I've got a drawer full of them, eh? Just and it's the fact that, well, you, you can't get that one, even if you go, well, not so much in the shops. Right, because the, the website or whatever. Aye, but, yeah. But you can't get that one because it's got the tour dates on the back, yeah. or it's it's got this or that, or the next yeah. thing, or a different design or something. Yeah. So uh, totally, but that's uh, that's um, important, and that's also for me. I make a point of it af- at the gigs as well. You know, after the set or whatever, when you're getting kind of close to the end, last tune or whatever, I'll be there and like at I the merch. But give us a shout. We're all friendly, happy people. Aye. Come up, give. I'll be there in the next 10, 15 minutes. I'll be doing at the table. Come and say hello. Aye. and people will come and speak to you Yeah. and you tend to find that th- you see those people again mm-hmm. you know like people who will come if up well, and they say like you, you. Uh-huh. then why would they not come back to see you totally. they've came the first time and if you and go, you've delivered the goods if you go there as well and you know you spend that five minutes and you're blithering away you're having a chat about oh. stuff eh, eh, that's, it goes a long way because yeah. people will go yeah, well, remember him I or and you, you see their faces and what's interesting as well is that they become you know, I think you can get into the into the trap because everyone's online. You then see people, you then speak to people right. as such. You know, it's, it's messages. It's social media, but it, it, it's not very social. It's not got that personal touch. You know what I mean? But when somebody comes up to you and you have that chat after the gig, it becomes a thing. Mm-hmm. And then when you see that person at a gig mm-hmm. again, you go, oh, again, like you reckon you right. remember them. Right. And that, that's a good confidence boost for yourself if. You've obviously done something right mm-hmm. that somebody is taking the time to come see you a second time or a third time, mm-hmm. fourth time. And I think that's something that you need to appreciate and remember as well because it's, I mean, you know yourself going to gigs, it's no, I, your ticket might cost you 20 quid, 30 quid, whatever it is to go and see, you know, mm-hmm. to go and see bigger bands nowadays. And, you know, but say, go, even going to a smaller gig, a be a local gig, yeah. it's a tenner, yeah. say 10, 15 quid. That's your 10, 15 quid to get in, but it doesn't cost you that for the night. It costs you a lot more than that. Well, you the need time, to go with 50, 60 quid in your pocket. By the time you get there, you know, a couple of drinks or go for food or whatever, or get a taxi home or even yeah. drive, mm-hmm. um, it cost me about 20, 30 quid to get through to Glasgow. You know I'm I mean? just, just wishing it was all Even if I take the car. All the these old, pri- old prices still, uh, still remain. <laughs> Slipknot, tenner. I couldn't get a ticket for them at the end of the year for less than 150 quid. Pantera for a lemon. Well, there's, a, there's one up there that will shock you, up. <coughs> Metallica. Five and six. <laughs> 19 quid. 19 pound for Metallica. Right. Amazing. Last time I seen them, I think I was 100 quid a ticket. Nah. It's crazy, yeah. Right. But, but guess what? I'm still going back to see them because they're delivering the goods. Absolutely. And because, you know, if, if somebody spends that kind of money to come and see me once, you know, I'm, I'm eternally grateful. Never mind if if you see the same faces coming, coming again and again and again. It's a mate. It just it blows my. It baffles me. You know what I mean? 
proper humbled by it, the fact that somebody would actually. But there's also come something. Along and see it, eh? I mean, there's some. You've done both, mm-hmm. but there's something very different in a good way. You show up to a pub mm-hmm. doing your, your your cover songs. Yeah, right? you're making good money mm-hmm. if you're doing plenty uh, plenty of them, right? Yeah. But you turn up to to a gig, and there's no guarantee the pub's going to be busy. Nope. There's no guarantee that the people in the pub are going to enjoy it. They're probably not there specifically to see you. No. They're there regardless of you being there. Mm-hmm. You just kind of turn up, play, get on with it. Yeah. Doing your own stuff. There's something nice that you actually write something and another individual who you don't know mm-hmm. likes it. That, that that's was, a pretty cool feeling. It is. It's awesome. And I remember. I still remember that the first time I saw somebody at one of one of my gigs. And the reason I'm saying a stranger is, it's almost like your family and friends that are. They have to say, yeah, yeah. I like that. But that's see, exactly what see I was to connect say. with a stranger to connect with something that you've wrote. Uh huh. It's a pretty cool feeling. It's amazing. It's it's brilliant. And the first, the first time you see somebody, exactly like what you say, that's a stranger, mm-hmm. somebody you don't know, yeah. who's bought a ticket to come and see you, I think that's amazing. Mm-hmm. That is, that's a girl blows my mind. Still, I don't know why. You know, it's a strange, it's, it's a strange any, thing to wrestle in your it's mind. It's a strange thing, but then it's not any different from you going to see. No, it's not your favourite band because they're writing something that yeah, connects totally. with you. Mm-hmm. It's exactly the same thing, but it just it just seems weird. But it's different when it's like, flipped around. Ah, and yeah, you're weird. the one writing the stuff. Ah, it's weird. Uh, Especially because, like, I don't know if you're the same, but I hate the sound of my own voice. Like, I've got used to it. Have you? It, but that was again. I think that was a confidence thing. Uh, maybe because uh, you know, years ago when you'd hear if somebody had a tape recorder, mm-hmm. that actually sound like that when you hear yourself talking. I like singing, like, like. I like doing the gig, like mm-hmm. I like performing and doing the gig yeah. of it. But I wouldn't want to listen to it back, so it blows my mind that other people do. Which is, nah. I'm grateful. I think that's, that's just a self-conscious thing. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. But a uh, last question for you then, right? Before uh, I'll, I'll leave you in peace. Mount Rushmore. Uh-huh. Who is the the top four musicians or bands that you put at the top of the pile for yourself that you think, whether it be songwriting, mm-hmm. um, whether it be their appearance, their performance, just the, the overall package. Who are the four musicians or bands you put at the top that you just, for you, they are the top, the top four in no particular order? In no particular order. Guns and Roses. Foo Fighters. Green Day and Stereophonics. Really? All for very, all for different reasons. And you know why I love that question? Every single person I get come on, they give you a completely different answer. Really? Aye. How many is on Mount Rushmore? Four? Four. Aye. I mean, didn't get me wrong. That would be why you, you asked you, me for you, four. You could, pers- <laughs> you could personally go on and on and on. Aye, I could. I really could. Cause and I was... you know what's funny though? If you pick four, mm-hmm. they're not all the same. No. Guns N' Roses are not the same as Green Day, but are no. not the same as Foo Fighters, no. and they're not the same as Stereophonics. Aye. And I, I, I think they're all... They're all different, and I like them all for different reasons. Yeah, you know, but they. That's, that's, that, that's, that's the four my, for you. That's the four for me. Yeah. Right. I had to pick. Martin, thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, mate. Until next it's been time. a pleasure. Until next and, uh, time. Remember, I want that t-shirt. I'll get it. <laughs> I'll, I'll drop it off next week. Right. Cheers.